for those who've been here regularly, you will remember that the series of messages I'm sharing from this pulpit has to do with falling in love with the creator of the universe, falling in love with Jesus, because all religion in Christianity is for this objective, that we will love God. But to love him, we need to get to know him. And when you really know him, you will not be able to hold back your love to him unless you push him away. And this is what our subject is this morning. That there are people who actually reject God's love. And I have entitled our subject with the words, The Things That Quench Our Love. But I, there comes a, a, a thought straight away to my mind, is there such a thing as love being quenched? Can you quench love? Well, we just read in our scripture reading, is it possible to quench love? Let's go back there. It tells us here that in Song of Solomon 8, where it says, in verse uh, 7, many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. So here it declares that love cannot be quenched. Love is a indomitable force that cannot be conquered. And when you look further in the scriptures, it says, God is love. <laughs> and that opens up the understanding a little. If love is qualified by the God of the universe, then can he be quenched? Can he be conquered? No, he can't. And the devil himself wanted to conquer him, but he completely was conquered himself by love. So love cannot be quenched. Let's read another scripture to show how indomitable love actually is. It's written there in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, and th then verse 7 and 8. There in verse 4, the, the whole verses from 4 to 8 talk about love. And I'm just check, pointing out some, uh, some powers of love that cannot be altered. It says in verse 4 there, in the very first line, charity or love suffereth long. So if love is brought to suffer, does it become quenched? No, it suffers long. Then we come across to verse 7 and 8. It says, Love beareth all things. What does love do? Can it be overpowered? No, it bears. It bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. So here is a, a second witness in the scripture that love cannot be quenched. So this is an interesting meditation for us now. Love cannot be quenched by anything. It suffers all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Nothing can be done 
to quench it. Yet, if you come to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, we read there in verse 12. And this is why many people have said to me, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, I want to tell you it doesn't. But it appears that way. Here it appears as though the Bible contradicts itself. Matthew 24, verse 12. It says, <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That word wax is the old English word for growing cold, grow cold. It grows cold. So, love can grow cold, but we read that love cannot be quenched. Love does not, is not affected by anything that would cause it to be quenched. So, let's try to understand this. If love cannot be quenched, why is it that Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold? Well, we read it again by his own words in Revelation 2, where he speaks to the early Christian church about 100 AD, where this applies. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And he has something against that early Christian church. He says there, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have something against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So here is the early Christian church and we know how on fire they became with Jesus Christ. The disciples after his death and resurrection were on fire and, and many people were added to the church because of the love that vibrated in their hearts towards Jesus. But as the church grew and multitudes joined the church, there came a point in time where that love began to wane. He says, I have this against you that you have lost your first love. And the very wording helps you to understand. Does love fail? Love doesn't fail, but what fails? You, you church, he said, you have lost that love. That's the problem. And uh, we read on comments in regards to this in the Bible commentary by E.G. White. It said there, this change is represented as a spiritual fall. Once again, it is all for Bible Commentary, Volume 7. The losing of the first love is specified as a moral fall. So the people who have loved, and they have the love of God installed into their hearts, it's there, but it can be lost because people lose their focus upon the spiritual overtures that God had communicated with them through Jesus Christ. Love was not the problem. It can't be quenched. As we read there, it never faileth. The problem lies with the human vessel. Now this is very interestingly expressed in the Bible. The vessel, which is you and me, receives something poured into it. And it's in there, and it's written here beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4. We read verses 6 and 7. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Let's ponder these words for a moment. Here is the, the ability of God, who is love. He who created this world out of darkness, God spoke, let there be light in Genesis 1. Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. God can speak light and bring light out of darkness. God can do that. And so he then goes on to say here in Corinthians, in our heart, which is black, dark with sin, dark with corruption, dark with everything that confuses the mind, as we saw in the story of, of, um, of uh, Saul of Tarsus. When Jesus came into his presence, his darkness was revealed. <laughs> he went blind. And that's what sin actually does produce. It produces darkness, and when the light of God shines upon it, the darkness becomes prominent. And then that darkness can be impregnated with the knowledge of the glory of God, the heart that is dark with sin the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is brought into the heart. And so we have this treasure, this love, this glory of God poured into the vessel in an earthen vessel. And now that earthen vessel is not the love it is God that is love in the face of Jesus Christ whom we receive into our conscious life and then what can happen? Does love die out? No. It is the vessel that loses it. It is the vessel that lets other stuff pour in and that if you've got, for instance, oil in a vessel, and then you pour water into it, the oil floats to the top and you keep on pouring and eventually the oil flows out over the top and it's gone. And that is a very good object lesson because the Holy Spirit of God's love is oil, represented in the Bible as the oil. And so the oil of the Holy Spirit is in the vessel and all the other rubbish that is being poured into it, the oil comes to the surface and flows out. And as a consequence, the love is lost. And so in the writings of E.G. White there in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 957, paragraph 1, it says, It is our work to know our special failings and sins which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness and quenched our first love. It is our work because it has been lost by many Christians. The true love of God is lost by many Christians and the, 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 the task that is, put, is portrayed here, it is our work to know what these things are, these special failings and sins which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness that quenches our first love. 
and the word quenching there is not to be understood that love itself is, is dying out in itself. It is simply taken out of our hearts. And so this is the purpose of our meditation during this time, this morning. To understand the special failings in the Christian's heart and life which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness for the love to go. And those who have been watching the world and Christendom in general, isn't this what has happened to Christendom? Go to the First and the Second World War and find what Christendom has done. And go back to the Dark Ages and see what Christendom has done. It has totally lost the, faith, the love and the true nature of God. Yet they claim to be Christians. So let's go back to the Corinthian statement here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And notice here that we were specifically reading about God's glory which is identified in the words of Jesus as his love. We read it there, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, verse 6, hath shined in our hearts to give. So God has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. This is how the love is to flood into the heart. The glory of God. What did Jesus say was the glory of God? Let's turn to his words in John chapter 17. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 24 to 26. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 17, verse 24 to 20 and 26. This is the glory of God that Jesus wants us to appreciate. John 17, verse 24. Father, here is Jesus speaking to God in prayer. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Why does Jesus want them to be with him? That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Now notice how he qualifies that. He wants them to see his glory, which the Father had given him. What was that? For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. The glory that exists between Father and Son was His love. And then come to verse 26. And here it is. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. It is, the, it is the task of Jesus Christ to bring to the human heart the love that existed between the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three persons of the Godhead. There was a relationship between them that the human race knows nothing of. And it was Jesus who came down and is pleading here. Notice how he is pleading earnestly and how he is laboring to get this across to the human believers that they might know the glory of God which was his love that existed between these three persons of the Godhead. Our dark, sinful heart had no love of that nature because sin is self-absorbed. 
the only love that we know of is a love of a wonderful sensation. Through sin, we love somebody petting me. You know what it's like when young couples first fall in love? One feels nice about the other because the other is nice to them. <laughs> is that the kind of love that God is? <laughs> and you can see why the problem is on this planet. Because people have selfish love. They want to be loved. And when they are loved, then they will love again. And there is a big confusion in the world today in regards to love. Shattered. Sensation and hope. Nothing nice anymore. They start off well and then, you know what it is, when romance wears off after marriage, bang. There's arguments, there's fights. And wherever you look today, wherever you look, divorce, divorce, divorce. But not only that, warfare, attack, nastiness, because selfish love is ruling. But true love, which comes from God, in the face of Jesus Christ, as we read it there, that is something totally different. And let's, let's spend some time in beholding that love. For instance, he's writing there in Jeremiah to the Jews who had, who had become totally bereft of God's love. They were beginning to worship other gods. And he was loving them and still wanted to help them. And look the way he spoke there. This was just before Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. And here is Jeremiah speaking to them. And he says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. These are words which are echoed by Jesus. He said, When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to him. Because there is something in Jesus that is so totally unselfish that begins to work on a heart that is bereft of happiness. You know, we love because we first become, because somebody's showing us love. And that's the, that's the avenue by which God comes to the human sinful heart. You can understand love when somebody gives it to you. And here I am. I'm giving you a love. It is God loving us with an everlasting love, even though these people were so bereft of love. They, were, they had become enemies of God. And we'd read this in the past. This is the love of God that while we were yet enemies, God gave us his son. While we were yet enemies. That's the love. And I read it here beautifully expressed in the book Amazing Grace, God's Amazing Grace, page 99. And there I read these beautiful concepts that I want us to just meditate and contemplate during this hour of worship. It's said here, in paragraph uh, 3, 4, Jesus would have us understand, remember we read it there, he was praying to the Father, that, you, that they would see my, thy glory. Jesus would have us understand the love of the Father. He would have us understand it. And he seeks to draw us to him by presenting his parental grace. He would have the whole field of our vision filled with the perfection of God's character. 
So Jesus is, is really trying to help us understand this love. He says, you loved me, Father, before I came to this planet, and now I want them to see that love. We go to paragraph um, um, 3, where it says, A plan has been devised whereby the wondrous grace and love of Christ shall stand revealed to the world. So in the heavenly councils, a plan was devised so that they could understand this love. In the infinite price paid by the Son of God to ransom man, the love of God is revealed. This glorious plan of redemption is ample in its provision to save the whole world. Remember those words, John 3.16? God so loved who? The world. That includes every individual living on this planet from the time of the beginning to the end. God wanted the whole world to visualize this love and save the world. Sinful and fallen man may be made complete in Jesus through the forgiveness of sin and the imputed righteousness of Christ. Imputed means it is applied to the heart of everyone who will believe. This love, this this unspeakable love, the Bible puts it, unspeakable love. It's a love that cannot be quenched. It's a love that comes and reveals a selflessness to forgive the person who has done God a dirty deal. Because that's what Adam and Eve did. That's what the human race has done. But he comes close to them. And he says, I want you to appreciate my love. I'm prepared to forgive. And it's going to cost me something. Let's go up to the second paragraph. It says, The Lord of life and glory. What did he do? The Lord of life and glory clothed his divinity, his Godhead, with humanity to demonstrate to man, that God, through the gift of Christ, would connect us with him. The whole world. He wanted to connect the whole world with him. So he brought Jesus Christ and connected the divine personage to the human and made a human out of him so that the human God man could actually demonstrate this love. Without a connection with God, no one can possibly be happy. <laughs> Hasn't that been demonstrated? You ask people, are you really happy? They say, oh yeah, because of this, that and the other thing. Oh, but, but just a moment, are you really happy? With all the fun you have, when you go out to do this and you go and do that and the other thing, but deep, deep, deep down inside, are you really happy? We can't be. It's impossible because disappointment is around the corner to every person. And we know it, we've experienced it, we've looked back at history and it's just disaster. So, without a connection with God, no one can possibly be happy. Fallen man is to learn that our Heavenly Father cannot be satisfied until His love embraces the repentant sinner, transformed through the merits of the spotless Lamb of God. And we saw an illustration of that in our study this morning. Saul of Tarsus, angry and annoyed at the Christians, after them, killing them, all these ugly characteristics of his own personal pride and devotion, thinking he was doing God a favor when he was not demonstrating God's love at all, that person was confronted by Jesus and 
Je Jesus could actually transform him through this amazing demonstration of his love. And this is what God wants to do for every human being if they will respond. So there it is. He came to demonstrate it. And now notice in the last paragraph on page 99 it says, Christ came to manifest the love of God to the world, to draw the hearts of all men to himself. Why did he love him? So that they could enjoy the love that he had. The f and now is a very important statement. The first step toward salvation is, what is it? What is it the first step that you must take if you want to be saved? The first step toward salvation is to respond to the drawing of the love of Christ. If I want to be saved, people say, what must I do to be saved? Look at the love and respond. Simple as that. And that's what the early Christians did. They responded to it. They opened their hearts to it. And they were re rejoicing in a happiness and a love that was out of this world. So here is how love is gained. God's love is gained through this representation of Christ. And let us reflect a little longer here because I want to spend time with you here to really appreciate this love. We've already touched on it, but now we want to see a bit more. Let's linger in God's loving presence. For God so loved that he gave. And we had read that he dressed himself. He, God, dressed himself in the human body. Now that's easily said, but have a closer look at it. Really understand what this love is. And I'm reading it here from page 90 of the Upward Look. Let's really admire this. Christ, at an infinite cost, by a painful process, mysterious to the angels as well as to men, assumed humanity. Just read, stop there for a moment. He was God divine and by a painful process that even the angels were watching it taking place assumed humanity now tell me how did jesus assume humanity the story of christmas as the people use it today jesus was born of mary was he not before the birth what takes place Conception, is that right? And that was when the angel came to Mary, that holy thing in you is the Son of God. What's that? God would be constrained into a tiny, tiny, tiny little microscopic item and joined together with the ovum of Mary. And there was a conception. Can you comprehend what it cost the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the Son of God? What did it cost him? An infinite cost by a painful process mysterious to the angels as well as to men, hiding his divinity, laying aside his glory. He was born a babe in Bethlehem. In human flesh, he lived the law of God, that 
he might condemn sin in the flesh and bear witness to the heavenly intelligences that the law was ordained to life and to ensure the happiness, peace, and eternal good of all who obey. What did Jesus come to earth for? To de demonstrate the love. Here is the beginning of the demonstration. Just place yourself, if you can in your imagination, as a living being up there in heaven. You're conscious of all your surroundings. The angels are worshipping you, etc., etc. And all of a sudden, by a choice that you have made, you are submitting yourself to the scientific constriction into an unconscious state. Because that seed that was born, that was conceived and then was born was unconscious, was it not? It wasn't knowing what was going on. But to come out of consciousness into unconsciousness was a painful process. Many people look at the cross of Jesus as the only thing that Jesus suffered. But the suffering started when he was constricted into an embryo. That's God's love. And then began a journey that was indescribable. It goes on to say here, this is the mystery of godliness, that one equal with the Father should clothe his divinity with humanity laying aside all the glory of his office as commander in heaven, that he should descend step after step into the path of humiliation. A path. There was the beginning of it. And then when he was born, it took him 12 years to become conscious of who he really was. And then living in the home of Mary and, and, and Joseph and being a carpenter up to the age of 30 when his brain was fully developed, spiritually and physically and mentally, then he became a minister for the human race. This was a step after step in the path of humiliation, enduring severe and still more severe abasement, sinless and undefiled, he stood in the judgment hall to be tried, to have his case investigated and pronounced upon by the very nation he had delivered from slavery. The Lord of glory was rejected and condemned, yea, spat upon, with contempt for what they regarded as his pretentious claims, men smote him in the face. And you know the rest of the story. Did you ever realize that the cross of Jesus was just the bottom of the pit. It happened long before. Step by step, down he came. And suffered humiliation with the human race, right to the nth degree. And what was it that he suffered when he became man and came to the cross? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. And speaking of God the Father, what did he do to Christ? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If whoever believes in this will discover that God had become man and now at the cross and also before the cross, even in, gets in, um, in the wilderness at his baptism, just after his baptism, he suffered the sin of the human race. He was made to be sin itself. So that you and I, who are sinful beings, might be transformed 
like him, to be like him. And uh, I just want you to meditate a little longer by reading this statement here, Desire of Ages. It's a really beautiful name, isn't it? Talking of Christ as the Desire of Ages. On page 111, this is a book well worth reading. The Desire of Ages. Page 111, I'm quoting here, at this amazing love that we are here contemplating. A love that can only be generated from the one who is love. Here in paragraph 3 and 4 I read. Jesus had just been baptized by John the Baptist. Coming up out of the water, Jesus bowed in prayer on the river bank. A new and important era was opening before him. This is another step. He was now upon a wider stage, entering on the conflict of his life. Though he was the Prince of Peace, his coming must be as the unleashing of a sword the kingdom he had come to establish was the opposite of that which the Jews desired. What did the Jews desire? They wanted to conquer the Romans, to set them free from Roman bondage. Jesus came with something different. He who was the foundation of the ritual and economy of Israel would be looked upon as its enemy and destroyer. He who had proclaimed the law upon Mount Sinai would be condemned as a transgressor. He who had come to break the power of Satan would be denounced as Beelzebub. No one upon earth had understood him. And during his ministry, he must still walk alone. Say, how do you feel about walking alone? You like it? Nobody to understand you. You know, that's how often we feel, don't we? Nobody can understand what's really deep inside of me. Jesus went through that. Throughout his life, his mother and his brothers did not comprehend his mission. Even his disciples did not understand him. He had dwelt in eternal light as one with God, but his life on earth must be spent in solitude. As one with us, he must bear the burden of our guilt and our woe. The sinless one must feel the shame of sin. The peace lover must dwell with strife. The truth must abide with falsehood, purity with vileness. Every sin, every discord, every defiling lust that transgression had brought was torture to his spirit. This is God. This is Jesus. This is love. Does not your heart burn within you if you believe this? Does not the heart burn with a desire to respond to this love? And that's the first step in salvation. Love is stirred into position here. This is how it is received. And Jesus said to the people who had received that, I have somewhat against you, in that you have lost your first love. You know, I often observe this. I have studied with people for the last 50 years, out of the Bible, like I'm sharing with you now. And I have seen people melt under this beautiful story. But 
depending on circumstances, this beautiful thing that has touched their hearts has over the years, in many cases, become quenched. Why? How can something that is so precious as what I've just shared with you here be lost? How is that possible? Remember, we need to understand that. Remember what I read there before? It is our work to know our special failings and sins which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness and quench our first love. It is important that we understand this. So now comes the most important, maybe not the most important, what I just shared with you was the most important, but this is just as important now that you follow carefully what it is that after your heart is touched with this love, what it is that causes it to be lost. Remember, you are a vessel. I am a vessel. And Jesus, knowing our problem, gives us a parable in the Bible to know how this is lost. Because this is gained by the word of God that we have been reading here, the descriptions as God's word. And as it falls upon our heart, Jesus describes here in Matthew 13, if you turn with me there, here now is the answer that we want to enlarge and expand upon as to what it is that causes this thing to be lost. Matthew 13, verses 3 through to 9. And it says, He spake many things unto them in parable, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> There's something to think about now. The word of God comes down and it is love. It is a seed which is to fall into our hearts and is to germinate. Love is to germinate. So there is one kind of p people that it falls upon and the heart is pretty hard. It's like a wayside that's been trampled underfoot. And the seed falls on there and it just bounces. Dun, 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 dun. The love bounces on a hard heart. And what happens? The birds come along and pick it up. Jesus enlarges that as we go across to verse 20. It says, But he that receiveth, sorry, 20, 19, when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives the seed by the wayside. So as we have been sitting here, we are being shown by the Lord that if I'm a person that is hearing this thing and it goes, wow, but because my heart has become so hardened, I find it difficult to even understand what this is all about. And the word goes boink, 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 boink on that heart and we go home after hearing something like this and what happens? The devil who's out there doesn't like what we've heard and he goes along, boink, take that out of there quick. So there is something here which is important and this does not mean that we are lost just because we've got a hard heart. You know what can happen? 
the minister of God can come and study with you and break that hard heart. You know, when a farmer sees that the, saw, that the wheat goes on to there, he can actually make sure that there's no hardness of the wayside. He can start cultivating that, turn it over. It might be a bit hard. He can use a bit of a whatever he wants to use to break it up. And this is often my experience in the ministry. I've come across some pretty hard people. And when I keep on working with them, it turns over. It starts to get soft. It's got a hard heart to start with, but after a while, then when the beautiful seed of truth starts falling in in its love pattern, it can take root. So that's just a little by the way, but the fact is if the heart doesn't want to become softened, it is snatched away. The love is lost. I heard the love, it was beautiful, but it's lost. Verse 20, But he that receiveth the seed into a stony place, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Oh, it's beautiful. That I love it. It's wonderful. Yet he has not root in himself, but dureth for a while. So yes, it's nice. I take it home. I meditate upon it during the week. Maybe it, I can keep it for a month. And then something begins to happen. For when tribulation... Or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. So that beautiful love that has been stirred becomes an offense because, oh, I didn't know I was going to go through persecution because of this. I didn't know this was going to happen or that was going to happen. And we go, Phew, forget it. And we forget the amazing love. That's what Jesus showed there. Then we come to verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. So there it grows amongst the weeds and thorns. And as the thorns grow, they grow faster than the Lord's beautiful love in the heart. And it overwhelms it, it chokes it. So what's that? The cares of the world. The, the negatives of experience of pursuing things that take preeminence over the love that we have contemplated. So there it is. Tribulation, persecution, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. Oh yeah, people hunt riches. But to hunt the wealth and the treasure of Jesus, that's second place. And so it becomes choked. But as you hear this, as you appreciate this, the, I'm sharing this with you so that all of us who are sitting at the foot of Jesus right now can actually say, right, if that's how it's done, that I can lose this beautiful love, I know now what to do. And that's what I'm hoping we will pick up here. Don't despair if you might be a wayside hearer or you might be a stony ground hearer or you might be a thorny surrounded hearer. Don't despair. We are getting, we're getting the answers of how to clean up the mess so that I can keep this love. I just want to read from Christ Object Lessons page 53 because there it is enlarged and that book deals with all the enlargements of this. And I'm reading page 53 here and there in paragraph 2 it says um, whatever attracts the mind from God whatever draws the affections away from Christ is an enemy to the soul. Are we looking for happiness? Are we looking for true love? Well, where did the love come from? It came from God, through Jesus Christ. And whatever it is that distracts us away from the source of this love is an enemy to my soul. Whatever it is. So there it is. 
These things, tribulation, persecution, the cares of this world, oh, so much, and especially today, we've been surrounded with so much compacted um, uh, concentration on issues of life that we haven't got time to contemplate on Jesus. You're here now, praise the Lord. When you go home, remember there is something very important to stay focused while we still have to care for the responsibilities of life. It's possible. But here we will now spend our closing moments in appreciating the detail of what Satan throws into our pathway so that we can identify it and deal with it so we don't lose this beautiful love. There it is in uh, Steps to Christ, page 71. How did you know I was going to read that? Hmm? Steps to Christ, page 71. I, you know this is one of my favorite uh, descriptions. And here is the answer. This was the answer to my soul when I was 21. I was ready to give up my Christianity. And here was the answer. And I said, yes, this is what's going to keep me going. The answer is here. It says, when the mind dwells Upon self, it is turned away from Christ, who is the source of strength and life. The love is the source. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. To prevent the appreciation of the actual love that Jesus came to impart to me. What are they? The pleasures of the world. If you are wrapped up with the pleasures of the world, can you think about the love of Jesus? Doesn't work, does it? That's Satan's work. The pleasures of the world. Life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. Are you surrounded with them? That's what Satan does to obliterate this beautiful picture. Life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. The faults of others. Or your own faults and imperfections. To any or all of these, Satan will seek to divert your mind. It's as simple as that. You've seen this beautiful love. You see what Jesus has done for you. You go, wow, this is too much. I love it. And then you go home and there, in comes all the floods. The thorns, the thistles, the perplexities, the burdens, whatever it is. And it floods me. And Satan says, come on, you know, you've got to face it. You've got to battle it. Keep on holding on to, on to your problems. Keep on thinking about them. Keep on letting him destroy your, your focus on Jesus. That's what I want you to do. Do not be misled by his devices. How conscientious are you? Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God because the love has started it, right? He who often... Sorry, I just... Uh, who desires to live for God... He too often, Satan too often leads to dwell upon their faults and weaknesses. And thus, by separating them from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. The love of God is poured into our hearts by the beautiful word that penetrates. And then he says, I have something against you, you've lost it. Why? Why? What's gone wrong? You have permitted the pleasures of the world, the cares and perplexities and sorrows and faults of others and your own faults and imperfections to get in front of your vision. Don't let Satan do this, it says. They are his devices. You're really conscientious. You desire to live for God. Satan too often leads you to dwell upon your own faults and weaknesses and thus by separating you from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. 
examine yourself in the light of this. I did that. And I said, right, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to let this take root in my life. This is what happened to the early Christian church. And I'll read it to you from inspiration. What was it that they, why did they lose their love? Why did they lose their first love? The very reason of steps to Christ. It says, the early Christians began to look for defects in one another. Is that hard? <laughs> you can see plenty of faults in people around you. And those of you who first come here, you can say, oh, what a wonderful church this is. And then you get closer and closer and you see faults. People here are still faulty. But don't think about it. Don't look at it. It says here, they, the early Christians, began to look for defects in one another. Dwelling upon mistakes. Encouraging suspicion and doubt. Giving way to unkind criticism. They lost sight of the Saviour. And they lost sight of the great love he had revealed for sinners. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory of the faith. You know what it's like when you, somebody is, is contradicting the theory of the faith. You stand up there and you're ready to combat. And this is what many ministers do, and I was nearly drawn into that. And I could see the danger. Not, right? They became more strict in regard to the theory of the faith. More severe in their criticisms. In their zeal to condemn others, they themselves erred. They forgot the lessons of brotherly love that Christ had taught. And saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. They did not realize that happiness and joy were going out of their lives. And they soon would dwell in darkness, having shut the love of God out of their hearts. So how was it done? The faults of others, the perplexities and the problems. What happens in your mind when you become surrounded by these dreadful things? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24? Because iniquity abounds, the love of many grows cold. Here is the simple answer. What were, th what were the people doing who were letting their love grow cold? They were beholding the horror and the corruption and the evil. They were thinking about it. They couldn't sleep at night. Their mind was occupied with it. This wrong and that wrong and I'm so bad too. Well, I may as well give up too. Have you ever gone through that at night time? I may as well give up. I may as well go and take my life. I went through that at the age of 21. Now I didn't want to live anymore. I saw at the age of 21 that... What I saw in my parents' relationship was going to happen with me in my marriage. And I thought, I don't want that. I don't want to live. And I was howling my eyes out. I've never cried like that in my life before. I saw ahead of me a life of misery. I didn't want to live, and so I thought, okay, I'll take my life. But then, uh, that's stupid, I may as well enjoy myself. So I may as well go and have the pleasures of the world, enjoy myself. Uh, I won't be stupid. I'll do everything reasonably, but you know, wine, women and song. I'll go and follow that up. And then there came that sweet voice that spoke to me from the age of 12 and said, but aren't I worthwhile living for? Yes. That was my decision. And brethren, I praise God this morning that I'm standing here preaching to you because I could have taken my life or I would be out there in the world enjoying myself thinking I was. But I'm here to testify to you that that love of Jesus, 
continued to follow me because I made a decision to hold on to him. And as he unveiled to me the progressive revelations of his love, I came to a point in life where I said, that's it, Lord, I don't want to ever lose it, whatever happens. And I decided I'm going to keep my face like a flint. No matter what people were saying about me or doing to me or doing to those around me, no matter how much evil I was looking at, I would not look to hold it in my heart. I would dismiss it. And this is what I want to conclude with you. You know, we have legitimate reasons to become distressed about things that happen around us. We really believe that is legitimate. I can get angry here. I can think about it. We can think that. But didn't Jesus have legitimate reasons? More than any one of us. He was the God of heaven. He could have said, to who it's about you, I'm not interested in you anymore. You, you're giving me too much trouble, I'm back. But what did he do? Read it with me. In First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Here it is. He was so treated, and as it says in verse 23, who, when he was reviled, what did he do? He reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Isn't that what he said at the cross? Uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Wasn't that love? He prayed for his persecutors. He had legitimate reasons. And he shows us and demonstrates us a love. And he says to you and me who are bombarded by iniquity around us, he says in verse 21, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Follow the love. Let that be the steps and come up to verse 19 and 20 there. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. And hasn't he demonstrated it? That's what he was like. And this is the love of God. This is what makes my heart pulsate. And as I see the darkness around me, as I see the corruptions around me, as I see battles in my own home life, I do not countenance this to let it continue to, to multiply around me in my mind, in my heart. Philippians chapter 4. And I want you to pay close attention to this, brethren and sisters, because I know that there are battles here in this church. I know there are individuals who have battles in the home, and there are many who become estranged from one another. Hasn't that happened to us? Here and there? Here is the counsel. Follow it with tenacity. Let nobody take the love out of your heart. Philippians 4, verses 4 onwards. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, <laughs> that's the love, the peace, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, you know, conclude all this. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, 
whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't think about the iniquity because iniquity abounds, the love of many will be thrown out. So don't think about it. Only think of all those good things. And there's heaps of things to think about every time the evil wants to come in and Satan throws it at your face. So there it is in verse 8. And in That I May Know Him, page 136, paragraph 2. Here it is. Beautiful answers. It says, We should bring the attractiveness of Christ into our Christian service. That's what it means to look at those beautiful things. The soft beams of the Son of Righteousness should shine into our hearts that we may be pleasant and cheerful and have a strong and blessed influence on all around us. The truth of Jesus Christ does not tend to gloom and sadness. We must look away from the disagreeable to Jesus. We must love him more, obtain more of his attractive beauty and grace of character and cease the contemplation of others' mistakes and errors. Did you catch that? Cease the contemplation of others' mistakes and errors. Did you get that? Please, wives, husbands. So hard to live in close range with one another, isn't it? Cease to contemplate your husband's or your wife's errors and mistakes. Don't contemplate it. It drives you insane. It drives you to such insanity that you don't even behave like a proper sensible person anymore. We should remember that our own ways, we should remember that our own ways are not faultless. One looks at the other and goes, yeah. And the other goes, yeah, but look at you, pot calling the kettle black. Right? That's true. We are not faultless. We make, make mistakes again and again. No one is perfect but Jesus. Think of him and be charmed away from yourself and from every disagreeable thing. For by beholding our defects, faith is weakened. God and his promises are lost from sight. The love is lost from sight. Aren't you happy we've got some answers? This makes my heart throb with joy in the midst of the iniquity that abounds around us. And there is a text. You know, the iniquity with its baleful impact upon our tender senses abounds. It's in your face. You can't help but see it. Don't stop to look and think upon it, that's all. There is a text, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verses 19 and 20. This is God's servant. This is the one who's opened his heart to the Lord. What will he do? Verse 19 and 20 of Isaiah 42. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect? And blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. You know, you can see things and you can hear things, but they don't have to penetrate. You can be blind to them. Yeah, what did you say? You know, um, uh, convenient amnesia. That's a good word. <laughs> I am conveniently not listening. I am conveniently not looking because my convenience is found in Jesus Christ. I don't want to see, I don't want to hear, although I look, and I'm looking for what Jesus is doing, that's all. 
I see lots of things in the world. And I was going to see, oh, yuck. Forget it. Think only on that which is good. You look to straight to Jesus and it's, it's gone. And he goes on and on. And because you're looking at everything through the eyes of Jesus, you see souls who can be helped. Remember what we had in the Sabbath school this morning? This cruel soul of Tarsus had something inside of him. And you look as a servant of God and go, ah, here it is. I was studying with one person for two years and the, the minister of the church that was together with me, he said, why do you waste your time with that man? Yeah, he's, he's not making any decisions. I said, it's all right. I can see something there. And that man was recovered from brain damage, from alcoholism, because he stuck and I stuck with him. This is what God can do. Don't give up on yourself. Don't look at the darkness. Look at the power of God. And when you will be counted in these last days in which we live, in which iniquity abounds, the love of many grows cold. But what was the next text in verse 13? But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. What is that enduring? What was that? 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love endureth all things. In other words, the love of God is held on to and he will endure all things. To the end. It's going to get more horrendous than it is now, friends, brethren and sisters. It's going to get much worse. And as the world is crumbling down around us, we want to practice what I have shared with you here. God's love will not be quenched out of your heart. May God help us to put it into practice. Please, put it into practice so that none of us need to be lost here. My heart goes out for every human being. No matter where they've come from, no matter what they've done, makes no difference. And especially those in the church, they may have fallen, they may have made serious mistakes, they may be cursed in my mind because of the evil they've done to me, but Jesus didn't curse them. Remember that. While the soul comes for mercy, no one has the right to shut them out. May God help us to hold on to that. It's my prayer. Amen. Shall we kneel before that hidden source? Father, indeed, to all human eyesight, you are hidden. But in you, Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, we know that there is a source of such comfort and such sanity that nothing on this earth can supply, only you. And Lord, we are kneeling before you just now. And we thank you that you have displayed to our mind's eye such a love. And we know that this love is in our earthen vessels. And Satan is at our, on our tracks to try and destroy. We thank you that he has been unveiled before our mind's eye. That he comes to us with all these tricks of his trade that we might be uh, made unconscious of your great love. Not to have communion with you, he will throw us into all kinds of perplexities. And because iniquity abounds, Jesus warned us. We thank you that we have gained answers, that if we will put them into practice, you will save us indeed. So help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Help us to not come away from this place and let Satan snap up those beautiful seeds of truth, of love. And let not the, the uh, 
burning heat of persecution and trouble uh, have any success in burning away our, our roots and drying up our love. And Father, that there be no thorns and thistles that would, and weeds that would, would choke our love, but that we will indeed let your beautiful word penetrate and continue to, to, to embrace this wonderful revelation. Let our hard hearts be softened by the beautiful work of your truth in our life. So bless us, Father, as we realize now more fully than before how important it is that we have a knowledge of you. Bless us to hold us firm by your side and on this Sabbath day, remember that you have said that this is the day, this is the sign whereby we have a, have a special pact between us that you are the Lord that doth sanctify us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you and we give our hearts to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.